so good day to you all. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today, and I'm very happy to be physically present here today. <laughs> and uh, I can just say that I have a brief sketch because uh, this topic is, in my opinion, quite large. So, um, of course, we'll have time for discussion and further questions. My name is Una Popovic. I come from the University of Novi Sad, from Faculty of Philosophy. So here's my contact, and of course, you can find my contact in other ways, too. Why does this? work? <laughs> Help? Mm -hmm. Just a yeah, sec. Okay. So uh, what I want to start with is uh, what I go against. Uh, so this is the primacy of theory. Primacy of theory principle. Okay, okay now. <laughs> Thank you again. So what I go against is and what I wish to stress with this primacy of theory principle is the famous and most common idea of education as a something that should be done in terms of uh, transmitting uh, some kind of knowledge from a teacher to a student. Usually the point is that it is a knowledge that should be transmitted with all the uh, problems like hierarchy between teacher and student and everything else with, that goes with that. And this is of course related to the rational side of our being, to higher cognitive powers. You can see here that I'm uh, using the terminology of modern ages. So reason, higher cognitive powers are in the, in the midst of this kind of ideal of education which has uh, determined our civilization in the most most of it and of course there is another possibility also known and also a tendency in the process of education that is that we are not transmitting just some kind of theory and just some kind of knowledge but also some kind some some sorts of skills and especially in the arts so uh, in the arts if we are learning we're learning how to do something how to draw how to use paints how to use I don't know some pencil or how to um, uh, play an instrument or so on so we are kind of acquiring skills not just the knowledge and I would like to um, challenge this kind of traditional PTP, as I will call it, uh, so primacy theory principle, uh, from the perspective of arts. And in those terms, I would just like to stress that even this kind of acquiring of skills in terms of education in arts is uh, a bit uh, under the weather of this primacy of theory principle. So, uh, although there is also a common idea that not everything about arts can, in fact, be learned or taught, those aspects of it that can, in fact, be learned or taught are usually transmitted in some kind of theoretical discourse. So, it's usually uh, also presented in terms of theory uh, besides this specific acquiring of skills. So. Uh, what I wish to, to draw from is, of course, of course, for me, not for you, modern age is philosophy, uh, because of a specific idea that came to being in that period. And uh, I'm talking about um, philosophers like Shaftesbury, uh, Ashley, Lord Ashley Cooper, and uh, Friedrich Schiller, of course, Alexander Baumgarten, and many others, too. So in terms of modern philosophy, uh, we have a new novel idea of uh, which could be used against this PTP, so primacy of theory principle. And the idea is that uh, uh, art experience, so the aesthetic experience we acquire when we are confronted with arts, can in fact be an uh, educational model which differs from this theoretical model of education and of transmitting of knowledge. So uh, how did they came to that? They came to that with a specific focus, specific stress they put on, they have put on aesthetic experience. And this has been done uh, in terms of uh, going against Plato's epistemological argument against arts, which is well known from, the, from his Republic, from the 10th book of his Republic. So uh, the stress that they have put on the aesthetic experience has also been a stress on the reception of the artwork. So what happens to us when we are confronted with some artwork? And the idea is that this kind of uh, confrontation makes some kind of 
trace on our souls. So it is something that happens to us, but it makes a trace on our souls. And uh, also very important idea for uh, these philosophers is that this kind of imprint on our soul that is made by the aesthetic experience is a specifically human feature. So aesthetic experience is something to be shared among humans, but humans only, so anima animals according to their opinion, no, no beauty, no, no art, so this is something specifically human. And this is important because being specifically human, aesthetic experience has to, has, has to have some kind of specific purpose for the human being. And this purpose we can trace and recognize as an educational one. The idea is that aesthetic experience should enhance human beings, should enhance human nature, and especially, or, exclusively in those respects which are either entirely or partially escaping the power of reason. So the main focus of theirs would be some kind of harmony between all of our soul's parts, so between higher and lower cognitive powers, and the harmony is also uh, specifically related to Schiller's positions, but it can also be traced in Shaisbury's writings or Baumgarten. So, um, here, again, I would like to stress the TPP. So although this all seems very nice and very uh, liberating in terms of uh, giving chance to irrational or non-rational parts of our being, actually uh, it's restricted to only to those parts of our being which are not being able to be, I don't know, to, to, which are escaping the grasp for reasons. So I would like to draw from this and uh, just to push it a bit further. So if we are to go against PTP, if we are to use arts, art experience, or even aesthetics uh, for that kind of purpose, then we should push this as far as we can. So we should see if there is a possibility of aesthetics experience to um, change our way of thought, even in terms of being rational, even in terms of how we understand what being rational means, even in terms of how we uh, devise our concepts and arguments. And this is what I want to, want to try to do, want to try to suggest, and this is the place where I will leave aside all this modern terminology, higher, lower cognitive powers, rational, irrational, and so on. So uh, what I want to present you with is the case of the dance. So the art of dance, of course, many other arts could be also example here, but I, I wanted to present the art of dance for many specific reasons. And uh, just give me a few minutes to, to, to stress why, why this art of dance. So uh, first of all, uh, aesthetics, that is philosophical aesthetics, I'm talking specifically of philosophy here, uh, did not take much, no, much attention uh, to the art of dance uh, up until 20th century and the, the second half of that 20th century. So this is one neglected art in the tradition of the aesthetics, philosophical aesthetics, I, I stress that again. And uh, it came to be mostly and most significantly in terms of phenomenological aesthetics. So in terms of phenomenology, why? Because uh, authors uh, of this prominence uh, have kind of decided to use phenomenological authors like uh, Husserl, Heidegger, Meloponti, uh, and their philosophies uh, as a platform, as a theoretical platform to question why is there such a lack of attention for dance in the tradition of aesthetics, and also to uh, criticize some of the central concepts in philosophy, in aesthetics, which are surely related to the case of dance, like body, soul, movement, space. We cannot devise any kind of um, aesthetics of dance uh, without using such concepts. So it was really important to see what do we actually mean by those concepts and how do we use it. And uh, the most significant idea, as you can see here, uh, from, the, from the phenomenology that took a great course in the uh, further development of the phenomenological aesthetics of dance, is the idea of linked body. So like Kerper, uh, difference that um, Husserl firstly made, and which was largely, largely uh, debated in the philosophy of Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Uh, the idea is that this lived body uh, is uh, uh, something, uh, the idea of body which uh, goes against, goes against 
the traditional ideas of body. So this body is not your usual body, uh, usual material object in the world which can be subjected and described in the theoretical discourse of the physics, for example, or chemistry or whatever science you wish. But uh, this kind of understanding of body uh, starts with our own personal consciousness, starts with the uh, way we experience our body, and uh, it um, stresses all those aspects which, would, which science would consider irrelevant. So, for example, uh, when communicating with other bodies, like this glass here, uh, I relate to it uh, starting from my own body, so it's far or near for me and from my point of view. And I'm currently cold or warm in this, in this um, room or whatever. So the idea is that this kind of um, conception of body just goes against the, uh, the PTP in terms of uh, going across the differences between rational, irrational, this kind of body is uh, um, both uh, understanding and sensitive and uh, the consciousness that is soul is not something uh, which is um, hierarchically in the better position than body, so consciousness is embodied. Uh, I quote here Michel Henry, who says, bodily knowledge is not a provisional knowledge, a primitive knowledge perhaps, but rather the foundation of all, of the ground and the ground of all. Our knowledge, uh, by which I wish to stress yet another idea, very important here, of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, that this kind of lived body experience is the most basic one in terms of knowledge. So this is the basic basic fact, basic experience we have, and all the other experiences are uh, just uh, developed from that point on. Uh, these are just two suggestions for you to see. These are two main uh, statisticians of dance in terms of phenomenology and some of their most important works. I just love to compare these two because uh, Sondra Freyli was actually a dancer, and uh, as a dancer, she wanted to reflect and to give some kind of theory upon, uh, upon dance and then she turned to phenomenology. So her books are uh, very much um, uh, from her own experiences. They have a direct connection with, with the dance. While Maxine Shields Johnson is your uh, regular academic philosopher who never had a dance class at, at all, but her works are much more conceptually developed, so much more philosophical. I draw from these two. So, where can we find PTP in terms of dance? In uh, at, at least two positions. Uh, in terms of dance education, which is accentuated by Paley, and uh, she says that we can find this problem when we're trying to learn young girls and young boys to be ballerinas or ballet dancers at all. What do they do? They have to treat their bodies as instruments. So they have to impose certain practices on their own bodies, even to the point of torture, as you may imagine, <laughs> to acquire some specific skills to be able to do fruité, for example. So this is the idea that your body as a dancing body is merely some kind of matter upon which something is to be um, uh, imprinted, and this is a violence against the body, so she speaks directly about it. Uh, in terms of generally speaking theory of dance, I quote here Descartes, so I, I mentioned Descartes, because all of them are uh, saying that Descartes is the one to be blamed for all of these problems, of course, because the separation of the soul and the body with uh, res extensors, res cogitans. So uh, Descartes is the one to be blamed in terms of this kind of instrumental understanding of the body, even in dance. And uh, Nouvelle probably is not that familiar to all of you. Nouvelle is uh, one of the most important choreographers and uh, ballet theori theoreticians from the 18th century who revolutionized the ballet um, in, in general in 18th century. But what did he do? He did not draw from the body. He did not draw from the dance. He used Aristotelian poetics and uh, used that model to organize new kind of dance in terms of uh, his reform. So we find here something very familiar in aesthetics and in arts. The theory is just, is just has the primacy over the practice. And in terms of dance, when, when you're talking about the aesthetic experience of dance, uh, we find that in context of the primacy of the vision. Just imagine yourself in the theater. So you're going to see a ballet performance. What are you going to do? You're going to see it. 
It's something to be seen. How do you see it? By sitting still in your chair in the theater, not trying to move, not trying to dance. Of course, there are some exceptions, but we're talking in general terms now. You're trying to sit as still as possible, not to disturb anyone beside you, and you do nothing. You concentrate on your vision, or perhaps a bit on your hearing if there is some music corresponding to that dance. So this is the idea. Primacy of vision in terms of aesthetic experience of dance is presenting us dance as something to be seen. And I don't have to, I suppose, I don't have to stress enough how loving relationship, how much is there a loving relationship between theory and vision since ancient times till now. So theory and vision are very much closed. So also we have here a sort of reduction of our um, aesthetic experience to only one part of the body, so to our eyes. Even in terms of ballet position, so how does, we, uh, how does the dance look like? Just imagine classical ballet, of course. How does it look like? Uh, the argument is the following. I imagine at a Basque. So uh, we have a, a point of a uh, ballet dancer just dancing, 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 then she just freezes. Yes, five minutes. Just freezes and leave the audience with an image, like a frozen fragment of the dance, which should be seen as a kind of a point of the entire dance. So I have only five minutes, so I will be very quick. The idea with the phenomenological aesthetics and the lived body is to reverse all this, is to point to, uh, to, point to the lived experience of our our own as the audience, as something that is especially related to the way we can feel and experience the dance. And this is something that can be emancipatory, which can be uh, related to the PTP against dance that is dance against PTP. Just look at this quote here from Fraley. We, the audience, envision and affirm our own resounding <coughs> presence through our direct lived experience of the dancer's present-centered performance. So it goes between us and the way we relate to this and uh, is that we are taking the primacy of the movement, not of the vision. So we react with our whole entire bodies, not only with our eyes. Again, I have to be much quicker than I am. As you can see, uh, the idea behind this change is that we are uh, moving bodies as such. So our basic experience and the way we relate to dance is related to our own bodies being aware of themselves as moving bodies. So the aesthetic experience of dance is a kinesthetic experience. I have to do this and skip a lot. So what I wanted to say here, using the example of dance only as an example, is that arts and aesthetics joined together can use and can be used for the purpose of questioning and changing of traditional idea of education. Why? Because uh, on the level of aesthetic, expe aesthetic experience of art, we can actually have change in the pre-reflective dimension of our consciousness, this lived body experience of dance, for example, and this can be actualized exactly through art. In terms of why do we need a theory, why do we need aesthetics of dance in these terms, uh, or in this case, is because this theory can help us to understand what are we missing and why are not we using these potentials for the change between, in terms of everything else uh, I talked before, so PTP. Many ideas related to PTP are already questioned and uh, put to some kind of critique in terms of phenomenological aesthetics. So I believe this whole, whole concept and, and practice, our practice uh, cluster can be used as a model for the development of an alternative view of education and learning in general, so transcending the dance. What I uh, wish to stress here is not that I'm, I'm not advocating for uh, kids or students to be uh, presented with more dance in their usual education, although I would stand for that, that's, that's just right, <laughs> that's just cool, or be, be it classes of dance or theater performance. I'm just advocating that this kind of experience and theory about it could be used for questioning of our general notions about educations because we 
could not just uh, transmit some kind of theoretical knowledge, but also use these pre-reflective changes which can be uh, brought upon by aesthetic experience. And uh, what would we get? We would get more sensitive, more encompassing, more relational view on the world because of the lived experience. Also, more flexible models of interpretation of reality, I would say again in accordance with our lived experience. Let me just do this. So I think Sondra Fraley says it much better than me. What should we expect? Dance pose, uh, passes directly between the dancer and the audience, actualizing a bodily lived aesthetics between them as it is expressed and experienced intersubjectively. So the idea is you cannot miss intersubjectivity here. I do not have enough time to explain upon that, but perhaps later. And again, dance closes the distance between self and other. As the dancer dances for others, she instantiates others in her dance and dances the body for everyone, of everyone, sorry. And just to be, just to be brief, for the final thing, for the, my final word, my final word will not be mine, but will be a word uh, of another, yet another, a very important person in terms of dance, this time choreographer, Edwin Hawkins, and I just love this quote, so I'll let him finish. Biblically, in the beginning was the word, but now the tender gesture could resurrect the world. Thank you so much. <laughs>